Welcome to our panel uh, on session on the impact of war in Ukraine, the Tokyo Di uh, Global Dialogue Season 4, uh, 2003. Um, we uh, are going to discuss about the, uh, the end of the post-Cold War era and the future of US-led international order uh, as a general theme, and we focus on the war on, in Ukraine this time. I'm Ken Endo, Chair of International Politics at the U University of Tokyo. I feel honored to navigate this panel of wonderful guests. Uh, but before introducing them, I should like to set out the background's sort of light motif of this session. As we all know, the war uh, in Ukraine has a number of repercussions re for international order which has, uh, had already been uh, through significant changes prior to it. This panel deals with this aspect, uh, but not all agree to what precisely are, are seen to be happening uh, with the diverse focuses, intensities, scopes, and time frames, and so on. Uh, basically, everybody has its own version of the events. Uh, with these uh, differences in mind, uh, uh, we try to explore the post-Ukrainian security order, especially in Europe and beyond. By the way, we are not precisely in the post. Uh, we are in the middle of Ukrainian war. Um, we have asked the panelists uh, a few questions prior to this event. Uh, mostly in line with them, I, I would like to modify slightly, if you don't mind, the older participants, uh, panelists here, in view of what have been already discussed uh, yesterday and, and this morning. Now first, we understand uh, we enter into a new era. The title of this uh, Jaya's uh, Tokyo Global Dialogue suggests you know, the end of post-Cold War era. Uh, I wonder what are the central features of this new era? Under what heading uh, should we grasp this new era? The term post uh, usually uh, is used when you don't come up with any precise idea or pre proper uh, adjective. Uh, Bill Emot, uh, sitting beside me, uh, short, shortly to present his argument, touched upon this uh, aspect yesterday in the opening session. He refers to this era as contested, fragmented, and disorderly, if I remember well. And hence my first question, how do you characterize the new era? If we refuse to be drawn into the Cold War analogy, what is it? And second, um, we want to discuss the forms, if not the system, of security in Europe and beyond in the years, if not decades, to come. More specifically, how will this uh, messy war in Ukraine, bloody war in Ukraine, comes to an end, if ever? I ask this um, because the ways and manners with which it is to be concluded will affect, certainly, the future security order. Will Russia be defeated, deflected, or partially satisfied? Will the security of Ukraine be guaranteed? If so, in what ways? It is not an easy task, as uh, any security guarantee short of the NATO membership may prove to be dysfunctional, while it is imperative to provide such guarantee to Ukraine, given the Budapest Memorandum, uh, given the fact that the, 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 the Budapest Memorandum uh, didn't work at all. Finland and Sweden will be in NATO eventually, uh, subject to the Turkish objection, while Ukraine um, perhaps unlikely to be in. Um, the EU might take Ukrainian in, but not without risks, perhaps, for themselves. And if, if I may add, the 
should we think of embracing uh, uh, suddenly Ukraine, but not only Ukraine, but also Russia in the future, as uh, President Macron of France has suggested, um, probably post Mr. Putin Russia into the European security structure. Um, I have no intention of decriminalizing the Russian aggression to Ukraine, but simply raise the issue of a political diplomatic settlement in trying to stabilize the Ukrainian-Russian or East-West relations in the long run. Finally, what would be the pitfalls, headaches, and challenges uh, ahead uh, in keeping the West unified and trying to um, uh, pull the world global opinion uh, into the line that uh, we may prefer? The West proved robust, robust in assisting Ukraine, sanctioning Russia. But is it enough? Is it enough, particularly for Ukraine, to retain its sovereignty, to recover its territorial integrity, which has been constantly attacked since 2014? Related to this, uh, what prospect do you have in, uh, in, the, in terms of the quality of the advanced democracies in the West? Uh, we frequently talked about the so-called populism a few years back. The heat may be receded, may have been receded, receded, but it is likely to be um, buried somewhere else and may come back at, at, at any time. I personally think the United States may be the biggest political risk, uh, given the fact that Mr. Trump and the likes uh, still have significant influence. Italy, UK, uh, many others may still go unstable too. So I ask. The, about the, the democratic foundations of uh, uh, the somewhat revived West. Now, uh, I would like to introduce um, uh, our panelist. Um, um, in order of speaking, uh, beside me, uh, Mr. Bill Emot, the chairman of the trustees, the Institute of International Strate Strategic Studies. Uh, in fact, personally, my, my hero from the 1980s, uh, from the time when he was the editor of The Economist. And second, uh, Ambassador uh, Sergei uh, Kosinski, the, uh, next to uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Bill Emot. Um, uh, he's a well-known ambassador of Ukraine to, to Japan, uh, especially amongst the social media uh, here in Japan. Um, now, the third, um, Ambassador um, uh, um, Hemant uh, Christian, uh, Christian Shin, the Director General of the Daily Policy Group, former Ambassador of India to our country, Japan. And fourth, uh, Dr. Andrei uh, Koltunov, uh, well-known uh, international relations expert in Russia, uh, now Director General uh, of the Russian International Affairs Council. And the fifth, uh, Dr. Ian Lesser, Vice President uh, of uh, and, and Executive Director uh, of German Marshall Fund of the United States uh, in Brussels. And finally, uh, uh, Dr. Shinji Hyodo, uh, he's uh, the Director uh, of Policy Studies Department at the National Institute for Defense Studies. Um, I would like to ask each speaker to keep uh, your initial talk to five minutes, um, uh, not more, uh, for, so that we could have a discussion afterward. So, um, Mr. Biremot, could you take the floor, please? Well, thank you very much, Endo Sensei, and it's a great pleasure to be part of this uh, really distinguished panel to discuss this important topic. I like to ask myself, um, what have we learned in the last 12 months? Um, and one thing we've learned is that this is a process that is not going to end uh, quickly, but the, uh, and we should not draw immediate sudden conclusions based on the picture on any one day. We have to take the long-term trends. But I think a second thing we've learned 
is that um, in the face of an essentially self-declared imperial uh, aggression and intervention declared by President Putin in countless speeches and articles in recent years as an imperial act um, to recreate what he believes is um, the, the rightful Russian empire, um, the response to that by the neighboring countries in Europe, by other countries that could be future parts of this Russian imperial ambition, and thirdly, crucially, by the United States and Japan, has been very strong indeed. In fact, I would say that uh, the initial pessimism about the West's response uh, has been proven to be completely unjustified. The first response that, that uh, the West was united about was economic sanctions. And in some ways, we have learned in the last 12 months that these economic sanctions are, are the least important of the forms of support to Ukraine and intervention in this conflict um, of what has been done. The economic sanctions were an important initial uh, 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 symbol, an important initial punishment, an important initial response, which declared a certain sense of resolution. But as time's gone on, it's been clear that Western support in financial terms, as with today's or yesterday's announcement by the Japanese government to pledge another 5.5 uh, billion uh, to support Ukraine, the continued flow of, of uh, weapons of, of uh, increasing quality, and crucially, the continued public support in the West really has been a very important lesson of the past uh, 12 months. My belief there will be consequences in Western politics from the recession, from the energy shock, from the cost of living crisis, from some of the expenses that uh, have been delivered uh, in rightful support of Ukraine in this conflict. But nevertheless, public opinion and political opinion is absolutely resolute, and I believe will continue for as long as it takes. Uh, I hope that will not be very long. Final thing we've learned, I think, in the last year is that this is a world that, as I said, uh, and Endo Sensei quoted, is contested, fragmented, and disorderly. Disorderly means it's dangerous. We have a conflict here involving uh, the largest holder of nuclear weapons in the world. We have other potential conflicts that we can see in, uh, in the Indo-Pacific that also involve countries with, uh, with uh, nuclear weapons. And we have getting involved in this conflict Iran, which has an ambition to achieve nuclear status and which is supplying weapons uh, to uh, the Soviet Union and has some potential to be the focus of a wider war. Highly disorderly. But finally, important recognition is that it is contested and that there is no clear dominant superpower in this world, not Russia, not China, not Europe, not Japan, not India, and not the United States. But we have learned that the United States remains first among equals, the indispensable nation, as Madeleine Albright, Secretary of State in the 1990s, called it. Without the United States support for Ukraine, European support would have been much more uh, vulnerable, much more, much more difficult. The United States remains the indispensable nation, and I believe its support for Ukraine over this principled issue um, of the rules-based international order, the sovereignty of states, the, uh, the uh, unacceptable nature of aggression and of the threat of use of nuclear weapons, I think will remain resolute. And although we have to accept that there is a presidential election in 2024, my belief is that actually the support will transcend that presidential election and continue. I'll stop there. That's my five minutes. Uh, thank you very much uh, for your uh, sharing uh, your own insi insights with us and within the limit of the time. Thank you. Uh, OK, Ambassador, next, please go ahead. 
<clears throat> Thank you very much uh, for inviting me to this distinguished panel. Uh, it is it is good time to talk about uh, what we what we see, what is happening in the world beyond uh, military activities on the front line. So I would like to share with you some of uh, my understanding. Uh, we try to uh, follow all the thinkings in the world. Uh, uh, and what we see is that people try to uh, find uh, rationale in this war, try to analyze it from point of view of logic or arguments. There is no rationale in this war at all. It's senseless, it's ruthless, it has absolutely uh, no uh, future, no meaning. Uh, and uh, uh, it, it is a result of paranoidical view of one person who have been doing this for many years, preparing himself and his country for a war with the West. That's exactly if we would uh, recall how it all began. It began from ultimatums, two of them. Russia put on the table in December 2021, demanding uh, absolutely impossible returning of what has happened in Europe for decades, uh, to withdraw NATO, etc., troops, etc., etc. Of course, it was clear from the very beginning it, didn't, it would not happen. So, uh, and then uh, being unable uh, to start a war on NATO territory, uh, Putin decided to attack uh, a neighbor and to uh, prove uh, uh, to the world that uh, Russia is a able a military force. If we, uh, again, if we recall some uh, ratings, we, we would uh, remember that uh, Russia army was put as number two, considered as number two in the world. Uh, after 12 months of war, uh, we now realize it's not just, it's neither number two, it is not an army. Uh, this is a bunch of bandits committing crimes every second of this war. Uh, and uh, that will lead uh, them nowhere. There is no military gains and uh, no political gains, quite opposite. What uh, if uh, we uh, turn this into geopolitic dimension, what we can say that geopolitic as we knew it before this aggression is uh, actually dead. None of the prominent analysts predicted uh, that this kind of aggression will happen. Yes, everyone was talking about aggressive Russia, assertive China, etc. but where war would begin and uh, if it all would happen, it was, uh, it was not predicted. So now we see a new wave, a new attempt actually happening in those days uh, to try to uh, create this new world order. Uh, and probably what we will see, uh, it will not be a unicentral. Uh, it will be probably two blocks of countries. One is around the United States. And I would argue that it, was, it is much wider than EU plus NATO, but I would see, the, see it in the form of Rammstein formula. Uh, I believe that this Rammstein uh, governings of nations which are supporting to Ukraine with military force and with political force uh, probably will stay because now it is clear that international institutions which should be responsible and which should maintain world order and peace, they are not working. Uh, United Nations Security Council is not working, and we know why, because Russia has veto power, and they never allow anything uh, happening in, uh, in this body uh, to stop uh, the aggression. Uh, other institutions and other regimes of uh, uh, military control, they are uh, almost nowhere. Some of them are still in place, thanks God, but uh, it is not uh, anything close to what we have had uh, in the end of the Cold War. So uh, we understand the, uh, what China would, uh, what Russia would like to achieve. Uh, intimidating uh, uh, Asian nations, uh, for ex uh, 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 organizing military exercises around Japan, uh, pushing North Korea uh, to be uh, more aggressive and to continue those uh, missiles launch. They want United States to stretch in between uh, Asia and Europe. Uh, probably similar goals uh, we can uh, attribute to po policy of China. Uh, they uh, would be very happy as well if, uh, uh, but in quite opposite direction, they would be happy if United States are concentrated in Europe uh, and not in Asia. Uh, and uh, 
definitely in uh, Chinese interest to see Russia gradually moving uh, to a status of power bank, uh, which will be just the energy supply uh, to uh, Chinese rejuvenation of the nation. Uh, because I mean, Chinese economy needs resources, and that is where they can get it. So uh, it is uh, uh, what is happening that instead of uh, uh, wish dreams, pipe dreams of uh, uh, Russian elite to have uh, free poles and uh, uh, the countries which are not, cannot be attributed to uh, 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 United States or China would gather around Russia, they will achieve absolutely nothing. They will achieve technological decay, economical uh, uh, dis uh, uh, destroyed economy, uh, and uh, uh, for uh, decades to come, the status of the country which nobody will trust, uh, will value, and uh, will cooperate with. So, uh, what when it comes to Ukraine, uh, I would like uh, a little bit. Uh, uh, I, I would like to say that I'm a little bit uh, uh, unhappy with your initial statements uh, uh, because definitely Ukraine will become a EU member. Definitely, and I would like to repeat it 10 times, definitely we will become NATO members. No question about that. It's in the interest of NATO, first of all, to take Ukrainian army, the most effective and the most experienced uh, in Europe, uh, in, inside the bloc, uh, and uh, all other things will depend on where Russia will be going. Let's uh, r remember that next year we will have four important elections. First, January, Taiwan. Then we have Russia, Ukraine, and United States. And outcome of those elections, um, uh, a lot uh, uh, connected to the success or uh, uh, level of success of Ukrainian forces. because. We, we can achieve only success. There is no question about uh, our defeat. We will win. I would stop on this. Thank you very much. Uh, it's great to have your view. And uh, the, uh, um, I, I didn't mean that the, you know, the possibility of, of Ukraine joining the, the EU is, is uh, uh, really out of question at all. Uh, um, and uh, and I, I appreciate your uh, reference to the sort of integrity of security between East and West. Um, uh, that is also a, a point that we may have to explore. <clears throat> now, uh, may I turn to Ambassador Sin? Um, I'm sure the view from the South is totally different. Uh, please go ahead. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Kenendo and my fellow panelists. Greetings from Delhi. I'm Hemant Singh at the Delhi Policy Group. We are meeting as the Ukraine conflict is about to enter its second year. And I realize that I am the only speaker from an emerging Asian power. The perspective which I will share is personal. And the reality that I see is more complex and nuanced than the background for this session suggests. Indeed, that the remarks so far suggest. Let me start with an observation on the global order. Great power competition remains the mainstay of global order, of, in, uh, I would say, of global geopolitics. What is different today is that the world's great powers have shed most constraints to their behavior as they engage in military aggression and economic coercion to establish regional primacy and global dominance. The burden of this contest is being borne mainly by developing countries whose interests are being marginalized. The current and overwhelming US focus on Russia is taking its attention away from what is essentially in the long term going to be a US-China contest for global primacy and influence. Now I'll turn to the Ukraine war. There is no question that Russia dealt a harsh blow to world order with its premeditated and increasingly brutal military aggression against Ukraine. This will greatly diminish its power, influence, and global standing. But this invasion was neither sudden nor unheralded. As an event, it emanated on the one hand from major Russian miscalculations, including perceptions of US weakness and Western disunity, and on the other, 
the failure of preventive diplomacy and the breakdown of conventional deterrence in Europe. More importantly, the invasion did not overturn any established order. Structural issues over the post-Cold War security order in Europe and ambivalence about Russia's role and standing in Europe have prevailed since 1991 and have never been settled. So to that extent, this was also a crisis that has been waiting to happen. Europe has a historical tendency to generate major wars and conflicts of ethnicity and religion are not new to it. The not so distant precedent for change of territorial status quo by military force already exists in Europe. Ukraine has every right to defend its territorial integrity and sovereignty. But what started as a conflict between neighbors has escalated into a major war involving the US, NATO, and the EU in an all out confrontation with Russia, using Ukraine as the proxy and so on. This has become a civilizational war for domination over European security order. The US has rallied its European allies, but is increasingly trapped by their demands for escalation in pursuit of a decisive victory, which is unlikely without the direct involvement of NATO. Incrementally, NATO is replacing Ukraine as Russia's main battlefield adversary. This can lead to unmanageable escalation and a strategic deterrence breakdown. There is good reason for the rest of the world to be seriously concerned about that prospect, especially as implausible scenarios of total victory are being contemplated. Russia is admittedly far weaker as a major power than the US and NATO combined, but it has considerable autonomous resources and capabilities. It can withstand prolonged conflict. Expectations of its imminent collapse are unrealistic. I would also add that Crimea is Russia's strategic jugular, providing warm water access and trade links across the crossroads of Eurasia. Its loss will be deemed as a catastrophe by anyone in power in Moscow. So what's the prospect looking forward from this conflict or at this conflict? Whatever the outcome, the resolution of Europe's historical antagonisms will become more difficult for decades to come and instability will persist. The West's manifest intent to crush Russia militarily and economically has already become an existential threat for Moscow. Whether, whether it is a prolonged war of attrition or a frozen conflict, the US will need to divert more resources to Europe, creating a persistent threat to its security interests on both European and Asian fronts. And the longer the war, war lasts, NATO's cumulative power will be progressively drained with serious consequences for the US and Europe. The US lacks the capability to constrain both China and Russia at the same time. Its power and influence is increasingly dependent on the contributions of allies. If the US-led alliance system is militarily and economically under stress, there will be adverse repercussions for stability in the Indo-Pacific, which is where India and Japan lie. Furthermore, an overextended Euro-Atlantic alliance and a battered Russia will provide strategic space to China, which has already been taking advantage of the European preoccupations of the US by flexing its muscles from the Himalayas to the East, to, to East Asia. Risks to the security of Japan and India will continue to grow. There is a critical difference I might remind the, the panelists and the viewers between Europe and the Indo-Pacific. In Europe, the US can be an offshore leader, leveraging the strength of its NATO allies. In Asia, if there is a conflict, the US will face its adversaries directly with limited contributions from its regional allies. It will have to lead from the front. The future of world order, in my view, will be decided in Asia and the Indo-Pacific and not in Europe. Let me tell you about the global response, why the global response has been divided. The majority of the world's nations comprising emerging powers and the global south are not taking sides between the West and Russia. The question is why? Well, a unified global response is possible only when the wider international community is being consulted and its perspectives and interests are being taken into account. The West is caught in a spiral of self-serving actions. Its unilateral coercive measures have disrupted the global economic order 
with devastating con consequences for developing countries. Rules-based order, particularly respect for territorial integrity and sovereignty, tends to be invoked mainly when the interests of the West are invo involved. And among here, among the emerging nations of Asia, a self-absorbed Europe is seen as far removed from the issues of stability and strategic balance in Asia. There is deep skepticism about expanding the remit of NATO to Asia, not least after the Afghanistan debacle. And there is growing concern about the West security and economic policy coordination through NATO and the G7, bypassing the larger committee of nations. So alienation of the rest is growing as already weak global institutions are sidelined or seen to serve mainly Western interests. I will end with a word about India's position. India has consistently called for and will continue to call for an end to the Ukraine war and resort to dialogue and diplomacy as the best way forward to peace. It will put its weight behind a cessation of hostilities and a negotiated resolution of the conflict. India's primary concern is with authoritarian expansionism and coercion in Asia, enhancing capacity to deter aggression, aligning threat mitigation strategies with Quad partners, and jointly contributing to a free and open Indo-Pacific remains India's foremost priority. And as chair of G20 this year, India's main focus will be on the interests of the global south. India will contribute constructively to a more inclusive and equitable distribution of global resources, finance, and technology. I'll stop here. Thank you very much for your patience, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ambassador, thank you very much indeed. The, the darker period may be forthcoming. Um, uh, uh, and I uh, um, understand the how the version uh, of the interpretation of the uh, today's era is different. Um, but uh, anyway, the, um, uh, we also need to listen to what the, uh, uh, the other side would, would, uh, would perceive. Uh, and um, uh, may I turn to Dr. Koltunov uh, to take the floor. Um, five minutes, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, first of all, let me say that I'm very grateful for having the chance uh, to be here. I think uh, it is important uh, to maintain uh, a dialogue, uh, even under current very challenging uh, circumstances. Let me also say that uh, it is very hard for me, like uh, I think for my Ukrainian counterpart, uh, uh, to stay detached from emotions. It is a very emotional issue for all of us. To some extent, we can argue that it is a personal tragedy. But nevertheless, as analysts, uh, we have to take a certain distance and to look at the situation as it involves. I will limit myself to only uh, four very brief points, and I can dwell on them later on if there is interest. Uh, first of all, uh, let me say that if I uh, were to use just uh, one word to describe the situation today after a year of very dramatic uh, and uh, very bloody uh, confrontation between Russia and Ukraine, I would say that this word would be resilience. I think that all sides of the conflict uh, demonstrated a degree of resilience, and the same can be applied uh, to the international system at large. Uh, first of all, of course, it was Ukraine which demonstrated uh, its ability to uh, sustain uh, the Russian military operation. Uh, its political system has not imploded. Uh, uh, its uh, society uh, did not uh, collapse. Uh, its uh, military uh, forces uh, continued fighting. Uh, to be fair, one should say that uh, the Russian economic system turned out to be more resilient than uh, many anticipated in the beginning of the conflict. Uh, it uh, has not crumbled under uh, the Western pressure. If you look at the uh, International Monetary Fund uh, forecasts uh, on the Russian performance uh, in this year, uh, they uh, think that Russia will experience even very moderate growth. We can also say that uh, President Putin is still uh, in control. Uh, the political opposition has not, uh, at least uh, for the time being, uh, has not uh, significantly increased uh, its uh, influence. We have not seen major street protests or demonstrations uh, in Moscow or in other major capital cities. Uh, the term resilience can be used to describe the position of the West. 
Again, there were many speculations that uh, the West uh, uh, will not maintain its cohesion, that uh, after the first uh, cycle of sanctions, we will see uh, more uh, dissenting figures uh, among Western nations, and uh, probably the uh, unity will be put under question. That has not happened. Now we observe the 10th package of sanctions against Russia, and I think that this cohesion of the West is likely to stay. And finally, the cohesion, well, the uh, commitment uh, of the Global South, as was mentioned by the previous speaker, to stay outside of the conflict, not to take sides between Russia and the West. It was also a remarkable demonstration of uh, resilience uh, exercised by major countries in the South. Uh, speaking of the international system, I would also say that uh, the system did not collapse completely. Uh, definitely the efficiency of uh, major international institutions went down. Uh, however, we can see that the global economy more or less absorbed the shocks of the conflict. If you look at the uh, energy prices, they remain at the same level as they were about a year ago. The same can be said uh, about uh, the uh, global food prices. There was an increased volatility in the financial markets, but again, uh, the crisis so far has not uh, triggered a global recession uh, or something similar to what uh, we observed uh, back in uh, 2008, uh, 2009 in the global financial system. Uh, so we can uh, talk about the resilience. However, the question is to what extent this resilience uh, 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 can be sustained over future. And I think that uh, we cannot take it for granted uh, because problems are being accumulated. Uh, instability factors uh, are also increasing over time. Uh, so essentially, we do not know at what uh, point uh, this resilience uh, might be replaced uh, by uh, major instabilities affecting various regions of the world and affecting the most important functional dimension of the uh, global economy uh, and uh, the global politics. There are a couple of independent variables which are likely uh, to define uh, the future of the international order. Uh, let me just uh, limit myself to uh, referring to some of them. Of course, the outcome of the conflict itself uh, is a critical factor. Uh, which will have uh, uh, an important impact on the future of the international system. And uh, we can speculate about various options. I uh, would not like to get into detail at this point. But the second, uh, I think the dynamics of the U.S.-China relations uh, is an important uh, uh, factor that would also have a very serious impact on the international system. Uh, the cohesion of the West, whether this cohesion is strategic, whether it goes beyond the conflict in Ukraine, or it is more or less tactical. I think uh, the answer to the question uh, will help uh, to understand the future of the international system. Uh, and uh, finally, the future of globalization, whether we face uh, a long-term decline uh, of uh, globalization trends, or it's a temporary setback, which will be replaced by a new wave of uh, globalization maybe by the end of this decade. Uh, so finally, uh, not, not to take uh, uh, too much of your time, let me say that uh, I've just uh, published uh, a relatively lengthy article uh, in uh, China International Security Review uh, on the scenarios of the global order transformation. And uh, in this article, I outline uh, three options. Uh, the first option is what I would call restoration which means that uh, the world uh, will move back uh, to the unipolar order, uh, uh, which uh, will resemble uh, what uh, the international system looked like uh, uh, in the end uh, of the last century, uh, with the unquestionable U.S. leadership and uh, uh, greater West uh, uh, lining up around the United States. Uh, the second uh, uh, option is what I call uh, reformation, and that implies uh, a grand bargain between the West and the rest, between the global North and the global South, uh, with a major, uh, uh, major uh, agreement between uh, the United States and China on the rules of the game. And uh, this uh, transformation order uh, provides for a more or less orderly uh, movement uh, from the current uh, uh, system to a new one, more inclusive and more democratic. And finally, uh, 
I foresee what I would call a, a revolution option, uh, which implies that uh, there'll be no agreement on the rules of the game. And we see not only regionalization uh, of the global politics, uh, but uh, atomization uh, of these politics uh, with uh, a deep crisis of uh, multilateralism in all its manifestations, uh, with uh, uh, surge in nationalism, arms race, proliferation of uh, nuclear weapons, and uh, high risks of uh, new conflicts emerging in other parts of the world, including Asia. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much indeed, uh, Dr. Koltunov, um, for uh, pretty detached and uh, relatively objective views uh, uh, on the current situation. Um, may I uh, turn to um, no, Mr. Koltunov, uh, the, uh, Dr. Ian Lesser, um, uh, please take the floor. Well, thank you very much. Very good to be with you. Um, you know, I've heard a lot so far that I actually agree with, uh, including a lot that uh, Andre just uh, said, in fact. Um, you know, I, I'm an American sitting in Brussels, uh, so let me maybe just offer you three reflections with this kind of uh, uh, unusual perspective. The first, you know, and, and again, we have uh, heard this from a number of the speakers already, uh, you know, the durability uh, Andre uses the term resilience. I, I would completely agree with that. The notion that we might have had, uh, you know, a few months ago, even that somehow this was going to be a, a conflict that would be over quickly, uh, that it would be resolved, that it would be stabilized. This is not where we've gone. Uh, and for all the reasons that have already been mentioned, um, I, resilient, I would agree, but clearly not stable. And there are many reasons for that. Uh, I, let me just mention one concern that I would have, which is that uh, the longer this conflict goes on, the greater the accumulated risk of things simply going wrong. I mean, I do think there there is a, a tendency in many ways for this conflict, not perhaps directly between Ukraine and Russia, but in its other contexts, uh, certainly as far as the United States sees it and NATO uh, and Russia, perhaps in its relations with the West, there, there are forces of limitation. I mean, for the president of the United States to visit Kyiv the other day, uh, in a sense, with an understanding that, uh, you know, nothing should happen to him, uh, this is very clear, there are forces of limitation in this. But I, I would say in many ways, we're in a world that is much more dangerous than during the Cold War. We don't have the understanding of, of strategic perspectives on either side, uh, the risk reduction measures that we had put in place with a lot of effort over decades, have largely eroded, gone away. Um, and we shouldn't just think that things can go wrong simply on the front line in Ukraine itself. Uh, the dynamics for escalation, for incidents, for things getting out of control, I mean, this could be in the Baltic, it could be in the Black Sea, it could be in the Eastern Mediterranean, it could be in the Sahel or Syria, many places where the West comes into contact with Russia uh, where things can go wrong. And so, uh, you know, we should, I think, be very much concerned with the prospects of continued limitation in this conflict, because the longer it goes on, the greater the accumulated risk. Um, the second observation I'd make is that, you know, and this is very clear, too, from what's been said so far, uh, alliances matter. We have populists in Europe and the United States and elsewhere who, who don't like this. They, they view it as, as a sort of one of these elite projects along with trade agreements and other things. It's true these alliances do matter. And it matters whether you're in or you're not. Uh, there is a certain formality to this. I, I, I agree, in fact, with what uh, the ambassador of Ukraine has said about that. Uh, it matters a great deal. It will matter for Ukraine. It matters for Finland and Sweden. Um, and, and these are going to be critical choices for NATO in the future for all the reasons that the ambassador mentioned. Um, I also think that the U.S. role is absolutely essential. It's an obvious point, but the war is underscored it in, in very dramatic ways. Probably 90 percent of what's being done for Ukraine today is being done by the United States or delivered by the United States. Um, that, I think, has been um, a sobering reality for many in Europe who may value the relationship with the United States, uh, broadly speaking, but are looking for more strategic autonomy in Europe. I, I think there is a realization that that might be 
coming, and it may even be in the American interest to have more uh, Europe in defense terms. Uh, but the measures of success there are going to be very practical and very tough. It's not just a matter of political aspiration. It's a matter of what Europe spends and what Europe does, and that's not a, a short-term project. Um, there's a link here, I would say, also to the Indo-Pacific in the sense that there is a, a kind of anxiety in Europe about America's longer-term strategic direction and the potential for you know, a very rapid shift uh, to the Indo-Pacific. There is a hope, of course, that it won't be rapid, that it's a gradual um, evolution and a gradual adjustment for Europe. You know, but it's very clear that things could go wrong in a similar fashion I was just mentioning uh, in Europe, it could go wrong in the Indo-Pacific, and we know what all the flashpoints are. Uh, if that were to happen, uh, you could see a very rapid shift of American attention and force posture uh, out of Europe. And that's something that I think Europe has hardly begun to, to reckon with. Uh, the, the final point I would make is um, it's just a comment on the global south. I think this is, in fact, a very important aspect of what we're seeing today. Uh, in some of the contours of this debate in the global south have already been mentioned. Um, I think we're seeing, in a sense, a kind of functional non-alignment. I say that, um, by that I mean, in moral and legal terms, I think there is a broad sense, uh, consensus in the global south that, that Russia's war of aggression in Ukraine uh, is not tolerable. And, and is de highly destabilizing for the international system. That said, uh, there are many equities in the relationship with Russia, just as there are with China. Uh, you see this in many different ways in different countries, very diverse, whether it's Brazil or South Africa or India or even Israel where there is an intense debate about this. Um, so condemnation, yes. Alignment with sanctions, no. Um, this, finally, I would say, is not something that... Um, there, there's a degree of realism about this, I think, in Washington and in Brussels. Uh, there is, a, I think, a sense that, um, that this kind of functional non-alignment is going to persist. It may exist in other conflicts, in other ways, and that we're simply headed to an environment in which this kind of diversity of view, even about animating conflicts, is going to be with us for a long time to come. Uh, so more fragmented for sure, more chaotic, uh, but again, I think uh, not stable. Let me end with that, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much indeed for the sharp insights. Uh, I really appreciate that. Um, so Hyodo Sensei, please. Yes, thank you. I'm Hyodo from the National Institute for Defense Studies, or NIDS. I'll be speaking Japanese. And uh, I'm so honored to be able to join this uh, panel with renowned experts from around the world. Thank you so very much for the invitation. Now, I am an expert on Russia. And for the past one year, the war in Ukraine has been analyzed. So I have personally been analyzing this uh, past year of evolution, and on February 24th, we'll be marking the second year, or just the end of one year of the war. But unfortunately, there's no prospects for an end, and uh, there does not seem to be a growing uh, momentum uh, toward a ceasefire, but the, the war is becoming even more complex, and uh, gradually there's a possibility that the uh, battle or the fighting may become even more escalated going forward. Now. I believe that uh, uh, President uh, Putin uh, will deliver a State of the Union address in Moscow later today. And last night, or yesterday, uh, President Biden visited Kiev. So uh, the anti-West rhetoric, I think, will most likely be strengthened by Russia, given these developments. So in that sense, uh, the, with the prolongation of the war, the confrontation between Russia and the West will become even more deeper 
and uh, severe, and uh, President Putin may strengthen his rhetoric about the deepening confrontation going forward. Now, as the war in Ukraine uh, becomes protracted, how does that change the international structure or order? Well, up to now, the underlying great power rivalry had been between the U.S. and China up to now. But due to the Ukrainian war, the war has uh, transformed the Conf confrontation to one between the U.S. and Europe versus China and Russia. And uh, so to support uh, the Ukraine and to sanction uh, Russia, uh, the West have become uh, even more united, and President Biden is attempting to strengthen that unity by visiting Kyiv this time. And aside from this, uh, China uh, Mr. Wen Yi has visited uh, Europe uh, for the Munich uh, conference and will be holding a foreign minister's meeting with the U.S. And uh, so the uh, unity between China and Russia is also deepening. And we are also seeing this confrontation developing into a tripolar standoff with the global south, which wants to stay out of the conflict, which doesn't want to take sides. And these three groups, can they all form poles? No, that's not necessarily the case, because the West are trying to or have barely maintained their unity in supporting the Ukraine. But when it comes to how to support the Ukraine or how to deal with Russia, there seems to be some differences in their approach. And uh, China and Russia are, of course, uh, sharing interests when it comes to anti-West or anti-US, but they're not monolithic as well. And as far as the Global South is concerned, they don't want to hedge their bets. So in that sense, the many countries are working for their own interests, and they're weighing their own interests as they contemplate how to deal with the rest of the world. So in that sense, the structure is not one where three strong poles are confronting one another. That's not the case. And regarding the U.S., Europe, and China-Russia confrontation, uh, some may characterize this with the rhetoric of democracy versus autocracy. And this phrase of course, can be used to, and is very effective in increasing the or strengthening the unity of each camp. But at the same time, it also harbors the risk of further deepening the conflict between the two. Uh, so it's also different from the bipolar world in the Cold War period, where there were two strong camps which were conflicting with one another. And this uh, war in the Ukraine has uh, triggered global inflation, energy and food crisis, etc. And all these crises have developed into domestic issues for governments of the world to deal with. So the West has held up its unity to a certain extent up to now. But as the war drags on, we may begin to see uh, a loss of interest in the war in the international community. Uh, even in the United States, we are already seeing signs of this happening. And also so-called support fatigue uh, demonstrated toward the Ukraine. And above all else, I think in order to maintain the uh, unity, the key factor will be the U.S. In the midterm elections last year uh, that uh, resulted in a split Congress in the United States, and so some fear that the U.S. Congress may be less active or less enthusiastic in support to the Ukraine. But as was seen by Biden's uh, visit to uh, give, I believe that uh, the West is uh, attempting, uh, including the U.S., uh, to maintain its uh, strong support for the Ukraine. Uh, so as the war is prolonged, the U.S. and the maintenance of unity in the West, I think, will be the key factor. And as was discussed earlier, once this war ends, what sort of a Russia uh, will 
emerge out of the rubbles of the war. And how to cope with Russia, or should we not even face up to Russia? How can we incorporate Russia into the international community, or should we not? And that sort of discussion is something that we should start, I think, to embark on now before the war ends. In any event, uh, Japan included, uh, we do hope that uh, oh, and we will exert all efforts and all necessary assistance and support in order to ensure as early an end to this war as possible. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Um, we have had this round table now. I uh, still have 30 minutes to go, uh, a bit less than I expected. But anyway, uh, we will have uh, discussions amongst panels uh, and then try to open uh, uh, this discussion to the floor at the end. Um, before, um, you know, the uh, putting the, uh, you know, the uh, circulating this, uh, uh, you know, trying to ask the uh, panelists to talk, um, I just wonder um, uh, one or two things. One is about the the uh, sort of, um, how to put it, the interpretation of the backgrounds leading to this bloody war. Um, this is not a session to explore systematically the reasons why this war happened, but Ambassador Sim mentioned about this in his speech. Um, uh, this may be important perhaps to revisit uh, because uh, to you know, gain hearts and minds in the global south, we may have to address this, uh, you know, the properly these reasons why this war happened. And second, um, you know, the, I uh, raise a question about how this war could, uh, uh, you know, come to an, an end. That that sort of, uh, you know, the ways and the manners uh, with which this war uh, ends may uh, well affect the uh, post-war uh, uh, security order. Uh, so uh, I want to raise these uh, issues. Uh, now, um, just uh, about the first thing, may I ask Ambassador Sin, uh, because you are one of the closest, fr closest friends to Japan, and the, uh, you still uh, mentioned, uh, you know, what you have said uh, just made me wonder how diverse the inter interpretation of this current era and th this war could be. Uh, and then I just wonder how to reconcile. And then you mentioned that the, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, in the process leading to this war, the, there was sort of miscalculation on the part of Russia. But at the same time, there was a failure in diplomacy and, and deterrence on the, on the part of the West, especially. Uh, um, yes, um, any war could be a sort of interaction between the two parts or two, three multi parties. Uh, so, uh, you know, it cannot be drawn uh, in, in, in one sidedly. But um, if I read the post Cold War history, uh, the West has tried to some extent to reconcile, to, to trying to embrace Russia, uh, you know, through OSCE, Council of Europe, you know, NATO Russia Council, WTO, and so on. Certainly, NATO membership was never been uh, offered, but the, with many other frameworks, the West was trying to embrace uh, Russia. Uh, and the NATO expansion uh, took place uh, not just because of the U.S. push, but also because of the aspiration on the part of the Eastern Asian, uh, sorry, Eastern European countries, to precisely to uh, protect themselves vis-à-vis uh, 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 -vis, uh, uh, potential uh, opponent. So I, I just wondered yeah, how to interpret this, uh, you know, the the back background behind this, uh, this war, historical one. Um, may I just uh, uh, first throw this question to Ambassador Sin and then, then move into the, the, the post-war uh, security structure? Uh, thank you, uh, thank you uh, uh, Professor Endo. Um, I'll make a very brief comment because I don't intend to repeat what I already said in my opening remarks. Um, the Ukraine conflict is fundamentally a war within the European civilization. Its origins lie in Europe, 
so do the solutions. So what I would say first and foremost is that both sides really need to introspect on their respective roles in bringing developments to the current place. And this, this is something which only Europe can do because as far as the rest of the world is concerned, we are waiting for the war to stop, but the protagonists won't have any of it. Now, there's another, uh, there is another issue which, uh, which arises that uh, what are the human and economic costs which Europe and uh, Russia are willing to bear? Isn't it time for both sides to start seriously reflecting on the, what the costs of total victory or total defeat are going to be? And also, what is the future which it will leave behind, the em embittered af aftermath, which might even last the rest of the century? So I think these are questions which fundamentally Europe must start to answer. And as far as the, the attempts in the past, and I'm, I really, there's no, not, time, no, not enough time to go into the history of what happened and how uh, Europe was accommodated after 1991 or not accommodated and what institutions were, were being planned. But clearly this has been a, entire series of missed opportunities, a entire generation, 30 years of time, should have been enough to accommodate uh, Russia stably in, in Europe. That's Europe, as far as I can see, Russia is a part of the European civilization. And uh, so it, it's up to Europe really to uh, uh, how to take this forward towards a resolution which, which needs to be definitely a cessation of the war and a negotiated solution. Everybody knows that that's what's going to happen in the end. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Bill, please jump in. I, I just want to jump in to respond to Ambassador Singh as a European because it seems to me that he has presented the issue in a very one-sided way. The fact is that there have been 30 years for Russia to accommodate itself to its place in European civilization and to the requirement that uh, of, of following basic rules of security uh, that have been discussed and agreed with Russia. But Russia has used radiological weapons on the soil of my country, the United Kingdom. It has used uh, a nerve agent on the soil of, the, of my country, the United Kingdom. It has flagrantly and repeatedly failed to seek to accommodate itself uh, within Europe. So I don't think you can see it as a, as a European failing uh, in this. But second point I think one should make is that thanks to the Russia-China joint statement on February the 4th last year, this is clearly not uh, a, simply a question of uh, uh, two European civilizations uh, battling each other. This is uh, a, a contest, perhaps in the, in the context of, uh, of Andrei Kortanov's uh, second uh, scenario of reformation, in which Russia and China are seeking a reformation of the way in which the world order uh, operates, a reformation in which superpowers have special rights uh, uh, and which uh, is directed very explicitly uh, against uh, West, the West and Western influence. Russia and China are both involved in this conflict, uh, thanks to that joint statement of February the 4th. Final point, Ukraine is not a proxy. Ukraine is the victim, and we are seeking to defend the victim. Thank you. Um, if I may, uh, I would like to turn to the question about this war itself. The, um, uh, Dr. Koltunov refers to the importance of the outcome of this war affecting the future. Now, uh, I'd like to ask uh, to um, Dr. Koltunov as well as Ambassador Kolsinski um, uh, about uh, this aspect. Uh, I know that this is a difficult question because the war is, is, is ongoing um, and in a variety of way, um, making lots of emotions, uh, but uh, 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 slightly, um, uh, seeing from the historical viewpoint uh, and projecting uh, this uh, uh, possible outcome into the future, um, how how would you um, sort of um, speculate the uh, the uh, plural scenarios of uh, outcomes 
uh, and how uh, how uh, they would affect the um, future security structure of Europe or or, 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 or beyond. And particularly, um, I was raising about the uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Macron's remarks uh, of the necessity of embracing Russia in the long run uh, after uh, providing the security guarantees to to Ukraine. Um, the, that that order is order is important. Uh, but uh, um, I, I, I just wonder how. Uh, you would uh, um, view this uh, uh, necessity of uh, embracing Russia in the long term to stabilize the east-west uh, Ukraine-Russia uh, uh, relations in the future. Uh, and, 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 and particularly to Ambassador Kol Kolsinski, um, um, I, we all know that the, the, the necessity of pushing back to the pre-2014 uh, uh, st uh, status quo, uh, so this is the, the situation, um, uh, and the after pushing back, the uh, you know, the uh, uh, we need to provide the security guarantees, which w one wasn't really provided uh, within the framework of Budapest Memorandum. Um, uh, but the, um, uh, the, some of the countries uh, prioritize the pushing back to the uh, 2022 uh, border, so not really border, sort of line. Uh, and some of the uh, NATO member states are not really willing to uh, provide the NATO membership. Uh, but short of NATO membership, what sort of security guarantees uh, we should conceive? Um, that is one particular question. So um, may I start to ask first uh, Dr. Koltunov uh, to respond uh, and, 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 and Ambassador afterward? Uh, thank you. I guess that uh, I am in a somewhat uh, privileged position compared to Ambassador Karsunsky because uh, I do not need uh, uh, to express the official Russian position. Uh, on top of that, uh, let me say that uh, if you follow the narrative coming uh, uh, from the Kremlin, it has always been quite ambiguous uh, in terms of the goals of the special military operation. And we've seen many interpretations uh, of what uh, the Russian leadership actually wants to accomplish. Uh, and uh, there were uh, some statements that uh, Russia needs uh, to demilitarize Ukraine and to denazify Ukraine, uh, and uh, even to reload uh, the Ukrainian straight project. Uh, however, we also heard uh, much more limited interpretations uh, of the goals uh, of uh, Mr. Putin and the leadership that uh, Essentially, it's about uh, safety of uh, the Donbas area and the Crimean Peninsula. Right now, there are many speculations uh, about uh, the uh, alleged uh, plans for a major offensive by Russia and Ukraine. I don't know whether this offensive uh, is being planned or whether it has already started. Uh, but uh, definitely, uh, we might see another cycle of escalation. Uh, of the conflict uh, within next couple of weeks or within next couple of months. Uh, this is unfortunate, but this is something that uh, cannot be ruled out. Uh, my personal take is that uh, at best uh, we can uh, hope uh, for uh, a kind of a ceasefire, uh, maybe within a couple of months from now, not a political settlement, not a final resolution of the conflict, uh, which will be extremely difficult to achieve, uh, but some temporary de-escalation, uh, which uh, might follow the current escalation cycle. Uh, in terms uh, of the future Russia's position uh, in the European security system, it's clear that Europe will continue to be divided in years to come. And these uh, divisions uh, will be probably more uh, significant than uh, they were during the Cold War. For instance, I cannot imagine any uh, a resurrection of the Russian-European uh, energy partnership. I think it's already history, and uh, it's not going uh, to uh, uh, to be with us anytime soon. However, both sides uh, should be interested in uh, 
uh, bringing down the risks uh, of an inadvertent escalation uh, of uh, a conflict in Europe that nobody wants. Uh, both sides should be interested in reducing the costs of the confrontation. So I think that, uh, and it sounds trivial, but I think that the best option that we have for next years, if nothing dramatic happens, if there are no radical political uh, shifts uh, on either side, if nothing happens, the only option we can look for uh, is getting back uh, to the old uh, Cold War pattern. Divided Europe with some very limited confidence building measures, uh, with uh, some communication lines restored between Moscow and Brussels, between uh, Moscow and uh, Washington, D.C., uh, and maybe a very gradual uh, restoration of, uh, you know, basic, uh, uh, basic uh, non-toxic areas of communication, for instance, you know, air traffic or some joint work uh, uh, on climate change and things like that. Uh, it is difficult uh, to imagine that uh, we will get back uh, to the idea of common European security uh, at least uh, for another couple of years. Uh, and uh, I think that we will have to live in a divided Europe. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Ambassador, please. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, when we talk about the uh, end of the war, that's the most regular question we have been asked uh, by everyone. How we see the end of this war? The formula is very simple. Uh, first, and there is no discussion about that, the full, every inch of our land occupied since 2014 must be liberated, Crimea included. There is no question about that. 95% of Ukrainians in every poll shows that we are ready to fight until uh, the goal is achieved. 89% of Ukrainians is ready to fight if even Russia would use tactical nuclear weapons. So with such a resolve, there is no question, uh, uh, and uh, we clearly articulate this position to our partners, uh, to the uh, democratic uh, community, that uh, this is number one. Number two, uh, uh, Russia must pay uh, we don't know the exact figure. Right now, we estimate uh, the loss of uh, our infrastructure, approximately $600 billion. So Russia must pay for uh, reconstruction of uh, this infrastructure. The third point, that uh, war criminals who organized and orchestrated and conducted this war, they must be prosecuted. We are working in all those directions. Nobody says it's easy. Nobody says it will be achieved tomorrow, but there is no other way. Every, we, we specifically now invited uh, um, uh, prosecutors from criminal, uh, with criminal experience from other countries uh, in Europe to help us to record and to, uh, to uh, investigate and to record all the cases, uh, particular cases of war crimes. We have already, if I'm not mistaken, 50,000 criminal cases opened ex against physical persons. The, the point is that this war is first war, major war, during time of Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Even war in Georgia was before Facebook. So now it's so easy to record and to follow because those Russian, I would call them soldiers, but they're not soldiers, those bandits who are in Ukraine, they, they record their own crimes and they put it on the internet so we can easily track them. We know where they live, we know their phone numbers, we know their families. So, and all those cases, one after another, have been recorded for future uh, tribunal against war crimes. This is very simple. And let me uh, uh, tell, uh, I would like to respond to this global south attitude, which is, generally speaking, uh, uh, correct, uh, correctly mentioned, but I would love to see uh, public polls conducted in those global South countries to understand whether really public there do not understand the uh, uh, substance of this war. Do they really support this uh, uh, undefined position of their governments? Because, uh, for example, if we talk about Japan, which is uh, 800 miles away, uh, from the war, 
And very recent polls, I was really, I was really impressed. Uh, it's, beyond, it's not even the right question. Impressed when 66% uh, of Japanese supported sanctions against Russia, is if even these sanctions will affect their personal lives. This is unbelievable. We know the economic situation in Japan. We know that prices for energy and for food, they're rising. And still, people clearly understand that what is going on is absolutely unacceptable from every turn, uh, every point of view. So that is, I think, if we thoroughly would investigate the vision in the world, we will see completely uh, uh, different picture. And that is reflected on the United Nations General Assembly votes. Uh, we, we have uh, absolute uh, uh, majority of countries uh, supporting Ukraine. Uh, so, uh, and uh, I would like as well uh, so, uh, to comment on whether Russia should be incorporated after, after the war somewhere. But Russia was already incorporated, G8. What, what else you want? G8, G20, Russia was, uh, we, we all know that Russia completely illegal a seat, uh, uh, have a seat in the United Nations Security Council. From legal point of view, uh, there is no reason to have Russia uh, in this body. But, okay, uh, Russia was incorporated in every European institution. And Russia completely blown all this away for its own uh, reason. Because, as I said, this is, you, 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 sh you cannot uh, approach the issue uh, uh, in, in, in terms of logic. This is completely paranoid uh, vision that NATO expansion is a threat to Russia. Really? Seriously? So you truly believe that uh, the countries with whom you have uh, very well-established uh, economic relations, uh, almost energy union, with your presence on every institution, uh, so many Europeans, uh, European companies open business in Russia. They, uh, they sit on the uh, governing bodies of Russia, uh, Russian companies, and you believe they will attack Russia. Come on, this is the same as Ukraine is now accused uh, as a country which was preparing to attack Russia with 600 uh, nuclear warheads. This is complete nonsense for internal consumption. We cannot accept this. Uh, and finally, uh, unfortunately, you know, uh, Professor, we, we speak Russian. And we, we uh, sometimes, uh, uh, under very special circumstances, we watch those TV shows, they uh, exist for 24 hours a day, uh, brainwashing Russian public. And uh, very recently, uh, the uh, nice gentleman whose name is Dugin, uh, uh, one of the confidants of Putin, he presented his simple vision. He said, there is two outcome of this war, Russia victory or the world demise. That's full stop. What we're talking about, what peace, what negotiations, until Russia will continue to brainwash its own public until Russia will fully, uh, uh, fully subdue any attempt uh, of uh, alternative uh, thinking inside the country. We can't negotiate about peace. The peace on Russian terms is ultimatum to Ukraine to disappear. To disappear as nation, to disappear as state, to disappear in language and culture and history. That's the only outcome for us. That is why we have no choice. We will fight. And uh, thanks God, we see no fatigue in the West. The more Russia escalate, the more unity we see. And again, I would completely agree with Jan, with uh, United States play absolutely enormous role in that. And this is a truly great achievement, the unity of the West achieved by United States efforts, by Great Britain support, but and now with Germany, France, Netherlands, Italy, and all the Central Europe, etc., etc., this is unbelievable, and we see no, uh, uh, a, a, not even single uh, 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 threat to this unity until the victory, as I said. So we want to liberate territory, to receive, to get money, to re uh, rebuild Ukraine, and to become member of the European institutions. And uh, war criminals must be prosecuted. Very simple formula. Thank you. Uh, points well taken. Thank you very much for the powerful intervention. Um, um, may I perhaps ask uh, 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 Dr. Lester and uh, Hyodo-sensei, uh, 
if you have any points to raise uh, at this point, uh, because eventually we, we would have to open the floor to the, to the public. Um, Dr. Lessa? I think it's muted, right? Sorry, my apologies. Uh, just one very simple comment. I mean, I think it is possible to imagine a circumstance under which this conflict stabilizes. I, I would agree with the point that it's very difficult to imagine at this point a kind of full settlement. Uh, but I think, you know, just looking at it objectively, both sides at the moment see um, the stakes are so high and the they have convinced themselves, uh, I think this takes more effort on the Russian side, but that's my view, they've convinced themselves that uh, that some sort of a definable victory is, is possible. And so we don't yet have this, the kind of conditions that would allow for a, a, a stabilization and a settlement. But I would say that the brutality of the conflict creates its own dynamics. Uh, and so far, uh, that uh, dynamic on the Western side, at least, uh, has been uh, growing cohesion, I would say, in fact, uh, especially on the sanctions front. But cohesion, political cohesion, uh, even if you just finally there is a kind of stabilization, whether it's with a political settlement or not, I think, again, the brutality, the dynamics there, you know, short of some fundamental political change in Moscow, Andre, forgive me. I mean, uh, I, I have great difficulty imagining the relationship with Russia going back to anything like it was 20 years ago. Great point. Thank you. Uh, Hyodo Sensei, would you have anything to say at this moment? Hi. Yes, thank you. Well, uh, the Japan's position and what we can do to support Ukraine in a unique way. Well, Japan cannot provide military assistance like the other West countries, so it'll have to be humanitarian aid. And some unique Japanese aid would be, for example, to help the reconstruction and rebuilding of the Ukraine and inject Japan's experience and know-how, because we have a lot of know-how. Uh, Japan's post-war reconstruction, and of course Japan has been hit with many natural disasters and many accidents, but we successfully were, was able to rebuild uh, societies after such uh, disasters. For example, about 30 percent of Ukraine has mines. And so uh, removing mines or detecting mines, I think that's one area where Japanese technology can be fully leveraged. And so uh, of course, we are still in a war situation. But the next stage would be the phase of reconstruction and rebuilding of Ukraine. And so Japan would like to take the leadership uh, once we reach that phase uh, to provide active support to the Ukraine. So that's my personal view and my personal wish. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, if uh, there is anybody really who wants to uh, raise uh, some points, uh, if there is nobody, I would like to open the f uh, this floor to the public and then uh, raise a few questions to the panelists. Can I? May I? Okay, um, there's one or two, no, two questions, basically. Um, one from um, uh, um, Huang Zongmin. Um, the, uh, according to the, the report from CSIS, uh, Russia was uh, buying millions of uh, artillery shells and rockets from North Korea. It seems like uh, Russia's weapon supply chain was seriously restricted by the international sanctions. Would you mind giving a brief comment about this situation and also about Russians' war potential in the future? I wonder who would be qualified to answer to this, perhaps ambassador or who? <laughs> 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 right, or Dr. Koltunov or, or Ian, perhaps, I don't know. Um, uh, this is about the uh, North Korea-Russia uh, connections. Uh, and, and please, go ahead. Uh, if I might start, you know, there are speculations here in Moscow that allegedly North Korea can uh, render significant military assistance to Russia, including uh, some military hardware. I tend to be very skeptical about that. Uh, I think that uh, uh, North Korea is not likely uh, to get involved in this conflict. Uh, uh, but uh, on the other hand, uh, if you look uh, at the uh, Russian defense sector, 
the, the sector is definitely booming right now. You'll see a lot of uh, uh, increases in the production. Uh, Russia might have problems with uh, high precision weapons. Uh, and uh, here, Russia depends uh, on uh, uh, foreign uh, uh, suppliers. Uh, and uh, these supplies might be in shortage right now. But in terms uh, of the basic military hardware, uh, like uh, artillery shells or uh, tanks, I don't think that Russia really needs a lot of uh, assistance from abroad. Uh, finally, let me also add that uh, if you look at the structure of the Russian-China trade over last year, you will not uh, record any significant increase of uh, Russia's uh, import uh, of uh, electronic uh, components uh, and chips from China. Uh, so this cooperation so far uh, is not dramatically growing. We don't know what will happen in future, but uh, definitely uh, in terms of the uh, core military hardware, Russia remains more or less self-sufficient. Thank you. I, I cannot confirm or deny figures, numbers of how much, of what, uh, but there is absolutely no doubt that there is a close military cooperation between North Korea and Russia. Uh, we know for sure that uh, uh, North Korea supplies weapons and uh, non-military equipment to Russia. Uh, how much, what kind of equipment, I cannot say, but definitely uh, they are cooperating very closely. Thank you. Um, if, if I might just add a, okay. a, just a comment on this, I, I would say that, Mr. Chairman, that everyone has been on all sides in this has been quite uh, stressed by the levels of consumption of armaments. I mean, this we are not we're not postured, I think, on any side for this kind of armament in depth, uh, and it's just simply one of the consequences of this conflict uh, going on for some time and continuing to go on for some time. Um, <clears throat> I would say that, you know, if indeed Russia is relying on uh, North Korea and uh, Iran uh, to fill some of these gaps, uh, this, is, this is, you know, a sign of, of deep weakness in the, the Russian defense industrial structure. And I would, you know, add another fact into this, which is that it's not just about the equipment. It's also about the intelligence uh, and the ability to strike with precision uh, that will reduce the levels of consumption. And there, I think Ukraine has got an extraordinary degree of support from the West, which is obvious. Thank you. Um, if I may, uh, uh, in according to the board, three minutes, but staff says one minute, um, one. Okay, so we don't have time. But there was another question about democracy and authoritarian, uh, sorry, authoritarian regimes. Um, perhaps uh, briefly to Ambassador Sin, um, you know, how, how, what kind of framework is needed to invite Global South's cooperation for the West's efforts to support Ukraine? Um, is there any, any way to buy hearts and minds of the Global South? Maybe this is not a brief question, but a brief answer, please. Yeah, I think, uh, thank you, Chair. I think we can start with uh, Japan and India working more closely together uh, as uh, respective chairs of G7 and G20 to try and address some of the main concerns which have emanated from the Global South over the past one year. Uh, that would be a very good start. Uh, as I said, there must be a more inclusive and equitable distribution of global resources finance and technology. And uh, I think Japan is particularly well-placed to make a start on, on, on that front. Uh, I must say that uh, uh, when it comes to uh, this debate between authoritarian and, uh, and uh, uh, authoritarians and democracy, well, uh, India, which is, aspires to strategic independence, always has to balance very carefully between its principles and values as a democracy, and between that and its realist core interests in the world of today, which is extremely divided. And this, uh, this, this is not an easy task. Uh, but we do try to contribute by saying that this, is, this must not be an era of war. We must move beyond. We must move to more cooperative approaches uh, and contribute constructively to the global debate. And at the end of the day, I might say also, since this is a Japanese audience we are addressing, 
that the, the roles played or the constructive roles played consecutively by Indonesia and India in bridging the world, in bringing the world closer together. These are important roles. And I hope that, I really hope that Japan and India can make a contribution in the same direction during the course of the coming months. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, apparently, we have exhausted our time frame and then also perhaps energy uh, uh, of the panelists too. But may I thank you very much indeed, all the panelists and the staff members who made this event possible. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you.